Hello, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you doing? They covered it up with something, thank God. They called me up. I don't know what they did, but I know that it has a big white thing over it. You got more hair than I got, Timothy, the sixth chapter, the Bible, First Timothy six. I'm going to read from the NIV if that's all right. To who knows, some bounce around versions. Uh, I do that because uh, different versions uh, tend to render a meaning a little bit better with the words. So I'm just going to kind of start. Six, six through thirteen. Six, six and thirteen. Uh, it reads, uh, "But godliness with contentment is great gain." Somebody say, "Great gain." Great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to be rich, those who want to get rich, fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called 
when you were made when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Hopefully, when you got saved, you, you made a confession and told somebody about it. So I'm walking with Jesus now. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Jesus, who will testify, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. I charge you. This is a challenge, I believe. Uh, we spent a few weeks talking and touching on uh, godly riches versus worldly riches. And we, um, I think we just started with um, the deceitfulness of riches. And last week we talked about uh, riches versus property out, out of po Proverbs. 38 through 9. And we pointed out that money can trick you. It will trick you. And it has the capacity to be deceitful. It promises something that, that it, uh, it cannot cash. It writes a check that it cannot cash. And we touched on various things, how money can make a person feel uh, contrary to what is reality. It, it can provide a safe feeling of false sense of security if you have it. This uh, week, Bible study, uh, I want to talk about if you want to be rich. If you want to be rich, not everyone wants to be rich. Um, but there are those who are saved who want to be rich. They, As the Bible says, they, they desire to be rich. And, and it tells us um, that they fall into a temptation and a snare. That, that the people who desire to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare. And I've got some good commentary from my, my beat up commentary here that I want to share as well. But that word desire is a strong word. It's, it's not a small word, a, a word we should roll right over. Ask my wife, are you hungry? She said, yes. I'm looking at something, yes. But if she says that she desires a bacon cheeseburger, I said, whoa. <laughs> Desire it. Well, something's going on. The idea of bacon is dancing in her head. But when we desire something, I think it's safe to say that we have taken it to another level. If you desire to be rich, this could be a problem. I think there is safe to say that most people, a lot of people who are rich, so many of them didn't start off to say, I want to be rich. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is from Jeff Bezos. And he says, don't chase the wave. That's what kids do these days. They're out here trying to catch the next hot thing, catch the wave. But if you've ever been to the ocean, you can't catch no wave, can you? Because it's always moving and then it crashes and it's gone and here comes the next one. You're trying to catch it, you can't catch the wave. But he says, instead position yourself for the wave. And what he's trying to say is find something that you are passionate about, that you love to do. This, this is talking about riches now. This is just, I'm off the book, sort of like Paul said, I'm going to speak as a man. I'm just giving you some good sound uh, stuff when it comes to riches. He said, instead of trying to catch the wave or trying to, you know, catch the Gino in a bottle, so to speak, position yourself for the wave, you know, like, like an athlete would do. A good athletic stance. And how you do that in this life is, is find something you're passionate about that you absolutely love. You know, um, I think Brother Kent was talking about QL barbecue here in Monty, and I'm not from Monty, but he said the folks would be lined up around the block for that because some man found something he was passionate about that he loved. The same way with us, but, and I hope to God there's something in ministry that you love. And a lot of times our faith walk, our Christian walk, 
as boring and dull as mundane, we're asking, what's going on? No, what's going on with you? Because the Bible said, you store up the gift. You know, we blame the church and the pastor. That has nothing to do with what God has called you to do. Well, it's an institution where walls are bringing people together. But a lot of times, you haven't found anything you're passionate about. If you find something you're passionate about, then people would be drawn to what you're passionate about. Even if it's putting together bundles of flowers, they say, oh my God, have you ever been over flowers and things? She loves to do this, and because she loves it, that is that benefit is forwarded to someone else. Maybe it's home decor, you know. But whatever it is, he's the Jeff Bezos, owner of Amazon, says, I, I, he, what he's saying, I've never started off to be rich. That's, that's the kind of riches you want. He, he never wanted money to hoard and, and line up the walls with it. He didn't want it to be furniture in his house. Uh, because saving money is good, but hoarding it is a problem. Saving money for unexpected expenses is a wonderful thing, but when you start loving money, you say, oh, I actually love the money, I desire to be rich, then he says that we're going to fall into a snare, but, but Jeff Bezos says, position yourself for the way. Don't be chasing it. It will come to you. Do you know that everybody has a time in life, man, to shine? And the only way you can really shine in your time is be ready when it's your time. You know, be ready when it's your time. When I came here in ministry, I said, you know, I didn't ask the preacher nothing. I just came to church. I wasn't trying to fight my way into the pulpit. When he asked me to preach, I said, are you sure? Because <laughs> I ain't sure. <laughs> uh, if, if, if you're sure, then that makes one of us. But I was positioning myself every single day. I'd be home reading the Bible. And I, was, I, was, I, had, I had a passion for it. And I didn't need to preach. I didn't need to teach. I didn't need a ministry. I didn't need to buy I would engage myself purposely with the things that I had mined from the scripture. And I'll rock people's minds and say, wow. So yeah, that made me happy. I, I it wasn't trying to chase a title in the church or get five minute block in the church. I wanted to just sit down with somebody and break the bread of life with them. That made me happy, and it still does. I have a passion for it. I'll never lose that passion. And that's how you get blessed, you position yourself like an athlete, and you do it by finding something, what do you love to do? And when you love to do it, hey, if you don't love it, why would anybody else love it? Sometimes some people say, hey, I want you to try this recipe. It is amazing. Yeah, you, you love it, don't you? <laughs> so you want to share that passionate thing with someone else. You know, if you love to sew, if you love to put clothes together, if you love home decor, a lot of times people are trying to sell you something that they don't even love. Poor salesman. You know, so Paul tells Timothy in this chapter book, he tells him, stir up the gift of God within you. Everybody has some beans and meat and sauce and seasonings in the bottom of their pot. And that God has put in there, we call it gifts. The Bible says that God has given to each man a portion according to the stature of the fullness of Christ. Just what God wanted us to have is what you got. And no one's gift is better than yours. You talk about a guy who, who loved logistics and business. Those classes we typically run from economics and stuff, don't we? But but he loved it. And he, he became rich from it because he loved what he did. He wasn't trying to get rich. But we're talking about those who would be rich. Those who desire to be rich, they, they, they don't desire to make a great birth. They don't really want, they don't want to, they don't, they don't love what they do. And I hope you can relate this to Christianity in your walk with God, because if that is the case, then you need to try to read, you know, sometimes in, in, a, in a corporation, they'll go in and they'll just throw stuff out and say, we're, we're starting from trash. This company's got off the wrong foot, and we're bringing some people in, we're going to try something new. It's pizza, pizza on Thursdays, and we're leaving early on Fridays, and nobody liked that last ball, so let's, Let's just clean the table. And sometimes when you walk with God, if you're if you're not if you're stagnant, if you're not blessing someone else, and if you're not loving what you do, clean the table off. Clean the table off and say, Lord, you know, return me to my first love. 
Refer me to my first love. Because if you're not passionate about it, if you don't love a thing, no one else is going to love it. No one else will love it. My mother loved kids. When she was five years old, she told everybody in our family, in her family, that, that she was going to have 15 kids. I, this is the God's honest truth. Everybody knows in my family. She had 15 kids. Matter of fact, she had 16. One of them died between my brother Gerald and, and David. Still work. But she did it. She was passionate. She loved kids. She loved kids. You know, and, and she did what she was passionate about. And I remember our house was being a place where everybody would come. Everybody. And people stayed and lived there. And some days I'd walk home and God would be walking out. Who is this man? You know? I remember that I remember particularly this older white gentleman. He had white facial hair and he had a blue jean jacket. But my mother and father, they made them to the poor. My mother and father made them in a place where people could come and be blessed and enjoy themselves. And we didn't have a whole lot. But you think we didn't need money to be happy. And they, they made sure we knew that. And some people in my family, I don't think they got it. They're still popping and popping because they didn't have enough money when they were little. I said, you missed everything, didn't you? You missed everything, and, and they're still missing it today. Money don't make you happy. I told I asked my got a friend, I said, what you doing today? He said, oh, nothing, I ain't got no money. I said, you can't do nothing without money? Oh, what am I going to do? What, what can't you do? You can do anything. <laughs> you don't need money to do anything, do you? Start your day with this idea. Being a blessing to somebody. And you won't need no money. You can walk up behind a lady pushing her car down and say, I'll push that for you. I'll carry your bag. You know, I'll cut your grass. But those who have desired to be rich, the Bible says this is what happened in the Bible, it's true. It says they fall in, fall into something that you didn't plan on doing, did you? You know? Remember in school, remember in school when you fall and trip and pray nobody watched you? And if you did, your friends were the first one to laugh you out of town. But but no one who is chasing money said, you know, I, I'm looking forward to money really tripping me up. Yeah. I, I, messing up my, my, my mind and my life. I was chasing this money. No, they it, it was an accidental thing. They didn't see it. And we already talked about in my first lesson that money is deceitful. If you really want money, set your mind on working for a long time and being disciplined with the stuff that you have. And no one wants to hear that, do they? So I thought, I've been working out these numbers. I've been playing these numbers, Pastor. Well, good luck. <laughs> Because I don't know if those numbers are going to get you what you want. If you want to be rich, work on working hard for a long time. You know, Bishop, Bishop, you got a nice house. I don't want to hear you talking, Bishop, because you got a nice house and, and you got a nice car and you got money. And he worked for General Motors for 40 years. <laughs> He didn't get he didn't get forty lottery cards. He, he set his mind that he was going to be stable, God bless you. That he was going to be blessed. And that he knew exactly how it was going to work. He didn't set his mind on being rich. He set he set his mind on doing something well. He became a, a a, a skilled tradesman or something there, General Motors, and he set his mind on doing something I'm enjoying, even in the confines of his own job. Sometimes at your job, you gotta say, I'm doing something different at this job. Is there anything else available? You know, I used to do this, but I just want to know, are you sure? Now, now they hire people for the sole purpose to come into a company and get people in the right place. I know that because I know a guy here wants to they hire to do it. His job is to look at people and find out do they love what they do. And, and it, it becomes a humongous blessing to a company because there's nothing like having people out of place in a company or a church. 
who are doing stuff more than they don't love, and they ain't no good at it. If you want to be rich, that's the title of the lesson. If you don't stroll in here late. First Corinthians, first Timothy six. First Timothy six. If you want to be rich, that's what the Bible said. Okay. Um, They fall into a temptation and a trap, and, and many foolish, wow, foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Now, the word in the King James Version is one of my favorite English words, is perdition. Tom Hanks has a movie called The Road to Perdition. But perdition is not a good thing. It's a bad place. You don't want to be in perdition. Okay. But, but, but money, and, and if you want to weigh this against the multitude of ways that people are trying to make money and the millions of uh, advertisers that tell you you can get rich quick, just do it. Because everywhere you look at, there's a scheme for you to make a whole bunch of money this year and surpass working hard for 30 years like every other person that actually got done. All you got to do is just give me $300. You give me $300, I'm going to show you how to do it. You can give them $150, and they didn't tell you the first step. Because the best things in life come to flower over time. And you might as well just buckle in and get ready and say, I'm going to be working for a while. And I got guys, I work with guys that say, you know, at Duke, they said, we've been here. 35 years, I got three years left. I said, there you go, it's right around the corner. They ain't talking about we about to get some lottery tickets. They said, we'll be back here tomorrow. Like we've been back here for 30 years. Sister Janice worked hard and she put in many years and she retired recently. What a blessing. Yeah, you are the But she, she, she wouldn't stop on her job and say, give me five minutes and we get these lottery tickets, because you never know. <laughs> Bible says they fall into foolish things. And, and you ever, I got a cousin, and every week he got another get rich scheme going. <laughs> I'm going to tell him, hey, I know how you can get rich. Get a job and go to work. <laughs> and keep on going to work. And if you look up in about seven years, you have a whole bunch of money. Yeah, do that. And be disciplined with the things that you have. But, but money offers itself often on, 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 the, on the bed of deceit. I'm going to offer you, I'm going to give you something. Remember, we, we acknowledge that sin is like that in general. But money is particular like that. You know? So let's just touch on a few things about wanting to be rich. The, the world of advertising is full of get rich schemes, most of which benefit the person who's advertising. Some years ago, uh, I fell for it, but I sent somebody 40 or $50 over in Africa. And no sooner than I had hit the button on Western Union, the Lord in his omnipotence shook his head. <laughs> So you'll never see that money again. I don't know what country in Uganda you sent that money to, but you'll never get that back. So don't do that again. That was foolish. And, and, I, and I thought to myself, man, I had to work. How many hours did it take me to make that $50? <laughs> and I'm throwing it away doing foolish stuff. And the amount of time it took me, because I remember I had to go to home and I did some stuff on the computer go here and go there and the time was several hours because time is money but the bible says that those that be rich they fall into foolish things that don't make no kind of sense we have 15 kids and, and my, my 14 brothers and sisters and i can just imagine every week my dad coming from home talking about betty uh, i got something else i'm gonna try this week i'm gonna be a blues player 
with the skin and bones walk around our house. No, he went to work every day. I got to go to work to get money. But what would have been foolish was thinking that he was going to raise 15 kids on, on a get rich quick scheme. And if you think these names are foolish, they are foolish, but there's a whole lot of people that's taking the hook, line, and sinker to that. Yes. Hook, line, and sinker. Okay? Um, these things seem foolish, but it's clear that they are tempting. You have to be honest. That they're foolish, you know they're foolish, we know they don't make no sense, but back in your mind, you have to be honest enough to say, some of this stuff is a little tempting. There's always that thought that maybe, what if that one in a hundred is? One in a hundred? That is a horrible percentage. But yet there's something in us as humans that makes you know, and maybe. Maybe this can happen. You ever seen that movie, Dumb and Number? Some of y'all have the other one, some of y'all are not telling the truth. So you remember when they asked him, she said, the lady told him, she said, there's no, there's no chance for us to ever be together. And he said, well, like one in a hundred, she said, more like one in a million. <laughs> and said, so you're saying I've got a chance. <laughs> I guess so, that's the chance you're talking about. Um, there's a real temptation that could be addictive to money and getting rich and wanting to be rich and a snare which wise people want to avoid. We got any wise people in here? More appealing, especially to younger people, is going all out to make more money and, and, and putting in ridiculous amount of hours, of an absorbent amount of time. It's not wise. Uh, remember the Bible has called us to moderation and we make excuses for why we're not doing what God said to. And then you find out that you're not happy. Because whenever we go against what God says, we're never happy. You know. Uh, but the, the world urges us to go all out, to make more money, do whatever you gotta do. This often involves uh, frequent changes in employment. I, I got a friend, she goes from job to job to job to job to job. I said, what are you chasing really? Money. Money, I said, I don't know if that would be what I would be chasing. I would find something you're passionate about or what do you want to do, where do you want to be in life? I told my wife several years ago, I said, I want to work from home, God, I'm gonna get there. I said, that's what I want. I don't really want money. I said, I want a job where I can be at home because time is the ultimate currency. You and I get no more of that time. And you'll never forget that. Every minute you waste, you'll never get that way. Okay, um, but the world tells us taking on additional jobs which create stress and no quality time in your life, no joy, that this is, this is the age that we live in. Coming home not happy. God don't want us to live like that. He doesn't want us to live like that. Career progression is important, I think, and a reward for honest work is a proper expectation, surely. Uh, the Bible commends honest work uh, to provide for oneself, 1 Thessalonians 3 and 10 through 12, and one's family, and, and it also, at 2 Thessalonians 3, it also rebukes people who don't take care of their family. So uh, it, it says, I believe that if that person is worse than an unbeliever, I said, wow, that's rough. Worse than an unbeliever? Yeah, God don't like lazy. He don't like lazy. But at, in the same breath, we're talking about those who want to be rich and the troubles that it can bring about. Okay. It, it, it is not that money itself is the problem. What is it? You know what it is. The love of money. As our verse states, money is necessary and it is useful as a means to an end. That's what it is. It's a means to an end. And if you want to know how frivolous it is, just try to rip it. See how easy it rips from top to bottom. 
it crumples up, it, it, it'll, it'll fold up, and it's easy to dispose of because it, it is supposed to be simply a means to an end. Money is for using. How many believe that? Money for happening. Have you ever met somebody that they didn't, they didn't want to spend all their money? Yeah, that money is for using. Believe it or not. And you're hungry and you won't even buy your own self a cheeseburger. Let alone me a cheeseburger. We both out because you don't know what money is for. You're supposed to use that money. Money is not for hoarding. It's not for hoarding. You know, savings are important for specific and unexpected and expenses, but, but that is different from just loving the luxury of having more. Because we live in a country where, I told you, 50% uh, of all the money is in the hands of 1% of the people. So we quickly understand that they're not giving up their money. And they couldn't spend a hundred million dollars of it, let alone six billion dollars. And people are dying and suffering and sick and they won't come off of it. Isn't that odd? Isn't it strange? Isn't it horrible? I think it is. Uh, you will know about people who have amassed a large amount of money, but, but at a great cost to them and to themselves and to their reputations. Um, if you get money in the fairest way, it's hard to shake a bad reputation. Once you got a bad reputation, it's hard to shake that thing. So, you know, one of the things I went not too long ago and got my mortgage license, but they told me right away when I took the exam, passed the exam, and while I was studying, they said, John, if you ever, Sister Joy knows because she's got an NMLS number. They tell you, if you ever get a fraud charge, you can never work in this industry again. Never. You can't go back, you can't appeal, you can't get Johnny Cochran if you knew was alive. Nothing. You can never work here again. If you are accused of any sort of money fraud, you can never work in this industry again. You know, it is a nice thing to consider, but, but in this country there are people who have, who have who have amassed large amounts of money, but at a great cost to their families. You know, I don't know how many men I've met who said, if I could go back, I would spend more time with my kids. There's no way I would have went to work like I did. I would have told that boss no for every day, every weekend of overtime. I never met somebody who said, so glad I didn't spend time at home with my family. Met one person that said that because I don't think that that's the general sentiment of how people feel. I think looking back, they understand that money was not important at all. That this, remember what the scripture says. It talks about having food and clothes, and we we read over it real quick. Like, oh yeah, food. God has been serious. We have to get in the mindset and develop a mindset that just having enough is good enough. You know, it's having enough is good enough. You have to have that mindset if, if you want to really enjoy life. Okay. Um, it has been well said that money cannot buy happiness. Money can't buy you happiness. It can't buy you happiness. And if you think that it can, then, then you're going against good sound teaching in the Bible. What can money buy you? Money can buy you a house, can it? But it can't buy you a home. And Luther said a house is not a home. <laughs> but there's no one there. Well, it ain't the house ain't a home. One day I was said something to my wife, she said, I'm going to go down to the road. I said, did I call her to leave? I'm in this house all by myself. I need my house to be a home. I love it that it's a home. Uh, money can buy you a bed, but it can't buy you a good night's sleep. It can't buy you rest. 
You know, there's a scripture that says, better is an ounce of hard seeds uh, than, than, than a pot full of gold. You know, better is a dinner where herbs are than a, than a fattened ox than in contention. You say, oh man, we eat good over here, but everybody's arguing though. We have to learn that sometimes it's good better to have less. Maybe let's split this, split this peanut butter and jelly sandwich and let's laugh about it. Instead of two folks arguing over who got the media portion of the steak. <laughs> Money can buy you food, but it can't buy you an appetite for the right things in life. You know, money can buy you all the food in the world, but it, but it can't give you the right kind of appetite. But God can. So you know which is more important, and of course, you know, of course you know that money cannot buy you a place in heaven. Uh, it can never pay for the price of sin. And there's people in this world that think that their money, you know, they, all you got to do is go to the graveyard, and they've got these huge, what do they call them? It, mo mausoleum? No mausoleum. I was going to say sarcophagus on the way off. But they buy these huge things, and they're ivory, and they've got veins. But that ain't going to get you to heaven. If you don't know Jesus Christ and him crucified as your Savior, that grave will be over when Jesus comes back. There, there might be one that don't even have no headstone. And that lady's going to be rising up. She's going to be waving at that time. Really. See you later. The Bible says that there'll be two, one taken, one to be at the mill grind. Amen. That's what it's going to be like when the Lord comes back. Amen. You better read it in your word. And I want to be the one that's taking up out of here. Because I got the Lord. I, money is not what I'm chasing. Money, every day there's an opportunity for dishonest gain. You know, one of my, I, I love the old songs, I love the old hymns, and I love the songs about our country. You know. But, but, what is it? God bless America. You know. God bless America. The hymn that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night of the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies and the oceans, the wide as low. God bless America. My home's be home. But, but then there's a, a portion of the song that says, you know, uh, let it, all success be nobleness and every gain divine. Let all success, if I have a success in my life, let it be noble. Yes. Let it be noble. You know, the, the world is full of men who live a crooked life, getting crooked money, and the gospel straightened and put them on the straight street. Women, same way, the world living crooked, and the gospel of Jesus Christ straightened out the need and put them on the right path. Amen. You know. But let all success be nobleness in, in every game divine. Oh, beautiful. America is beautiful. God, God shed his grace on us. God did it. He said, how did this country get to be what it is? I, I, wouldn't, rather, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. No. As much as we talk about it, I, I would not only when some of y'all got your mind on places, well, I'll tell you what, you go over there and let me know how it works. <laughs> but I'm going to stay here where my grandparents were. Yes. Amen. First uh, Peter 1 and 18, remember he says that it is not corruptible things that like silver or gold that watch you. And so it's important in our own lives to remember in our salvation and our walk with God that it was the precious blood of Jesus that washed you. You said, I mean, nobody paid for me at all. Oh, yes, they did. Yes, they did. Someone gave their life for you. And it wasn't your grandma, your dad, or your sister, your brother, your cousin. All the people that we really just 
Jesus acted full over no one. But the one who really gave it all was Jesus Christ. And we need a reminder of that. Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 1 and 18 and 19. He says, don't, don't you know that it was not perishable things that brought you, but the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I'll always be remembered. Paul said that I bear the marks of Jesus. Wow. Wow. You know, I, I, try to, this is, I try to take that and make my own. Whenever I'm being persecuted for my faith or something, I want the world to know that I bear marks of Jesus Christ on my body, on my person. I may not got beat with a cat of nine tails, but I put up with a lot of stuff and a lot of people because of the faith that I have. Amen. Everybody right. say amen. amen. You hope you put up with stuff. You ain't saved if you ain't put up with nothing. But because there's a difference between dark and light. Amen. There ought to be. Amen. You know. But it's, it's, it's a course that we ought to take, we ought to remember. If, if you want to be rich, I think the Bible is clear that there were rich men in the Bible. From, from Abraham, very rich. And he was the father, he's the progenitor of our faith. He is the, he is the archetype of what faith looks like. And if you want to look at the archetype of faith, look at Abraham. God called Abraham from the pit of idolatry and made him the father of a holy nation. Listen, y'all put that one over y'all's head. God called Abraham from the pit of idolatry. He didn't call him from the pulpit. He was not a priest. He called him from the murk and the mud of sin and idolatry and shame and lies and foolishness. And God made him the father of a holy nation. That's grace. That's what we call grace. That's how we got saved. But Abraham was rich. And when he after, he, after he, he was rich, he realized that he didn't want anybody to take credit for what God had done. And in every instance, he made sure that his gain was going to be what God wanted. He tried to shun every opportunity to get rich. And remember, uh, Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, when he had an encounter with him, he let him know he didn't want to take a name because he didn't want anybody to say that they had made him rich. He knew where his help come from. And a lot of times we, we're struggling financially because we don't know where our help comes from. The way, the way you can leave one job in a good way and go to the next is when you realize God got me. God got me. And he's leading me somewhere else. You know, when I was up General Motors a few months ago, my brother said, you ain't going to make that type of money no more. I said, I'm not in it for the money. I, I, I'm looking for something different that I'm passionate about. Amen. You're chasing money, though. Never, you're chasing something you'll never catch. Amen. Happiness locked up inside of money. Your kids don't want money. They, that's not going to make them happy. You can load up their pockets. That won't make them happy. You can have them sticking out like rabbit ears. And then they'll look and say, I'm not having no fun. <laughs> because money don't won't do that. I'm telling you. But trusting the Lord and following him and bringing him into our careers, which is a place we rarely bring God to. We separate church and godliness and holiness, and we put it all over here, and then we say, then I have my career and my friends. God has never designed your life to be like that. He wants to be a part of everything that you do. He wants to be decided who's going to be your friend, yeah, yeah. who's going to be your husband, who's going to be your wife, what you're going to do with your money. God wants to be a part of everything that we do. And a lot of times in our careers and, and even seeking gain, we're not making any progress because we're leaving out the one person who's able to open up the floodgates. You know, in the psalmist, he said, the gold is mine and the, and the silver is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills belong to the Lord. If you want something, ask him. He, he will open up the windows of heaven and give you a blessing. But you might find that that blessing, like Abraham, is going to require you, like he's told every believer, come out of it. 
every call from God is this. You come out from where you're at to follow me. It's not I'm going to bring you all this money in your mess. I'm going to give you every blessing. No, no, no. God stands outside of the world of you and calls you from that place to somewhere else. And every person that's ever been saved and ever will be saved has the same thing. God is calling you out and away from that old life. And if you're not willing to come out, remember the rich man. Oh, there he is. The Bible said he went away sorry. Because Jesus challenged the one thing. Remember how he did, people try to play Jesus. He said, Master, what, what good thing can I do to be saved? So Jesus knew what he was talking about because the man thought he could do his way to heaven. So Jesus said, why are you calling me good? No, I can tell you why I would call Jesus good. Because there was no God in his mouth. But, but Jesus wanted to address the unrighteousness in the man's heart who already had decided he was going to heaven because of the stuff he had done. And so Jesus asked the question, so, uh, why are you calling me good? Because if we can figure that out, maybe I can help you see that you ain't going to heaven. Not on your, not on your work. It ain't going to happen. But when Jesus finally got down to the brass tacks in that conversation, he told him, he said, go sell all you have. He, he addressed the one thing that stood between the man's heart and heaven. And, and we have to decide, what's the one thing that stands between you and heaven? Ooh. Jesus wants to know, sell everything you have and follow me. And the Bible said the man went away sorry. Because he didn't have it, he loved the money more than he wanted to follow the Lord. And we have to make up in our minds that God is first. The money, you can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. You'll find out as you progress and we get older that people take advantage of you for your money. Money, money can reveal stuff about people. They only come around when they it's the truth. I wish I was lying. Amen. They only come around to and I thought they loved me. Amen. That's true. They don't. They love money. They, they want to get it from everybody. I knew a little young girl. She was a hustler. She would ask everybody for $10. And had a big pocket full of money. 12 years old, and got more game than grown folks. I'm telling you, there's cameras out here. Ten dollar hustler. Hundred people give me ten dollars. What's a hundred times ten? Ten thousand. Something like it. Thousand. But look, I'm trying to be as serious as I can. I'm closing, and I'll, I want to segue a little bit into. Uh, if, if you are rich, I don't think we hit if you are rich, are we? And it's the same uh, same text, really. It's, it's 1 Timothy 6, as we're just worked down through here. It's such great teaching in Timothy. That as we get into next week, maybe this Sunday, because I just want to keep rolling, it says, command those who are rich. You see, the Bible has to be the authority in your life. And, and if it's not the authority, then, then he's not really Lord. No, if he's, not, if he's not the authority in your life, then you're the authority, then he's not really your Lord, is he? You have to have in your mind that Jesus is my Lord. His word is the authority and structure of my life, and I listen to it. The Bible says that if you know it and you don't do it, that's sin. Because God is good enough to not charge you for something you don't know. But he says if you know it and you don't do it, that's a sin. That's a problem. But it says, and as we get into next week or this Sunday, maybe if you are rich, command those who are rich, this is the commandment. And just think about, before I even say these words, think about how rich people are in this country. How would they be characterized, the rich people in this country? You ever watch uh, the Kardashians? I only got one honest person. My sister-in-law is the only person being honest today. Come on, Chris Darnell. <laughs> Me and you will sit together. Ain't nobody else watching these reality shows. Stop it! I'm 
because some of y'all ain't got hooked and drawn in. You ain't got to be ashamed of anything. Pastor ain't ashamed. You better not be ashamed. I'll tell the truth. But this is what the Bible says. We'll, 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 we'll sort of measure them up against the Kardashians. <laughs> never thought I'd say that name in church. <laughs> All the depth and the riches and the wisdom of God. How unsearchable are his judges and ways. Romans 11.32. Command those who are rich not to be haughty. Aren't, aren't rich people haughty? You know, there's the air about them when they're rich. You know, don't, don't, don't come too close. You might scratch them all watch, but we can't. They're wise. This is what the Lord says. If you're a Christian and you got money, don't act like the world. Don't be haughty and don't do this. Don't trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy you know and, and even if you you broken off if you ship a few fruits from the rich tree and you ain't got the whole tree yet if you got a little riches don't let it make you be hard you know if you ain't got to be Donald Trump to get this lesson. Some of us, we got a little money in them, then we stop being kind and giving and open and loving. You know? Amen. Amen. You know, if you got us with a new car, you can still give somebody a ride. You say, I don't want them to poke that leather seat. If you get that attitude, God don't let you poke that other seat. Okay? That's the kind of God we serve. <laughs> if you were acting all funny about that leather seat and how it smells and all that, God will let the baby throw up. <laughs> this is the God we serve. He, he don't like a, a, a primal spirit. You know, he wants to bring, he wants to keep us on, on an even kill. And, and Really, more than anything, as children of God. If you ain't saved, you know, we just let it rip because the Spirit ain't working in you anyway. But if God, if you are a saved child of God, God wants to bring these lessons home to us. He's our Father. And He's a good Father. But next week, we're going to get into all that in a little bit. And we find out first that it is never a good thing to be proud and haughty. As a church, please accept this from the pastor. Don't tell people you're godly proud. That there's no godly pride. All pride is hellish. Don't, don't tell anybody that. It, it's such a disheartening thing when I hear church people who've been washed in the blood tell people I'm godly proud. How? Where did you get, where, how did you put God and pride together and let it come out of your mouth? You gotta be ashamed of yourself. This is what you ought to say. I'm thankful. It takes the all praise and the glory off of me, which I was trying to get anyway when I say it, when I say it. And I put it back on the God who, who giveth all things, as he says, richly to enjoy. Yes. Don't tell nobody you got the proud. You got the mind. That's what you do. That's what you do when you got the mind. You devil. But don't tell them that. Don't lie to him. God is not proud. The Bible says he resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. And you say, oh, you know what I mean. The Bible says you're ensnared by the words of your mouth. So you have to speak those things that aren't, even if it ain't there. Just keep on saying it. You have power in life and death is locked up in your tongue. And if you don't start speaking the things that aren't there, they may never come to pass. I was telling myself something today though, that hadn't necessarily come to pass and the Lord said, don't forget the principles of faith. These ain't principles of the Marine Corps. These are principles that trickle down from heaven. Not to you open your mouth and declare those things. You declare those things. Don't let the devil trip you up about what God said. If he said it, I believe it, and that settled it. Ain't that what we used to say in the old church? We want to settle it today. So we find out first, as we, we consider 1 Timothy 6, 17 for this coming Sunday, or Bible study, depending on what the Lord does. At first, it is never a good thing to be proud and haughty. 
and it is wrong to look down on others or despise those. Remember when Job was given his uh, you know, logic about why he shouldn't be punished. One of the first things he said was, I, I feed the poor, and he did. He was faithful. He was faithful to see about poor people all the time. That's just an odd thing for rich people. To say that I have a, a testimony, a witness, and that I do, I've done this, and, and everybody knows it. But, but the Bible says don't, we don't want to look down upon others and despise those who, for whatever reason, seem to be beneath your status in importance. It don't take much for us to think we're better than everybody. And as Christians, you only need no money. All you got to do is got to save you. And then you got that Bible, you're ready to whack somebody in the head with it, ain't you? Don't do that. Don't do that. It was just the grace of God that God is where we're at. That's undeserved love. He didn't do anything. He didn't. We didn't champion salvation. <laughs> you go to a cross and you die for your sins? And nobody else says no. The Bible book I said, said I looked at the Lord said, I looked to my left and there wasn't nobody. Looked to my right and no one to the uphold. But my own arm got me salvation. That arm is Jesus Christ. God's hand extended. So we, we shouldn't look down upon people because they don't have what we have. They're not, they don't have our status that we think we have or our importance. You have to be very careful in the world that we live in today because we live in a wicked and perverse generation. Oh, yeah. And we can think that we are better than people who even are sinners. Look, man, it's just the grace of God. It's only the grace of God. So we shouldn't be looking our, our nose down upon people. That must be my cue at 7 o'clock. It's the Lord calling to see Wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> Love you all. I want you to keep on serving God and keep on loving you. Let's bow our heads in the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for being our Father. But we call on you today. We cry, Abba, Father. Hallelujah. We have need of today. We got some Abba, Father prayers in here tonight that need to go up. We speak of in the name of Jesus as a corporation, as your body, as your hand extended here on earth. We ask that you just lose revelation and knowledge, gifting and understanding. Uh, Lord Jesus, whatever has uh, been loosed in heaven, we ask you to loose it here on earth. And we bind the name that all God be in our lives and already bound in earth by your word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We decree and declare the legal power, Lord Jesus, to speak those things that are though they were in the name of Jesus. We thank you for power. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, the greatest power on earth today that we have it locked up inside of us. Uh, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power uh, may not be of us, but of God. Help us to see the excellence of the God is Christ. Hallelujah. The devil is a liar today. He's a liar. He's a big fat liar. But we thank you for being are holy, undefiled, good, and kind, just, full of mercy and grace. Hallelujah. Without impartiality, Lord, give us the wisdom that we need to have money. We ask right now that each person in here may have a newfound understanding of what it takes to, to have money and to have wealth. Um, help us, Lord Jesus, to obtain the homes that we need, the cars that we need uh, for our children. Uh, this is not just a flippant lesson or a didactic lesson, but we want these things to come to pass. And we are done expounding on these things. We are going to loose, Lord Jesus, the blessings that have already been loosed in heaven. We're going to loose them here on earth by the power of your word today. Devil, you're a liar. We put you under our feet today. And we speak prosperity, Lord Jesus, in the lives of every person in here. Spiritual prosperity, psychological prosperity, hallelujah, emotional prosperity, spiritual prosperity, physical prosperity, hallelujah. We thank you in his soul in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus, we thank you that we have no power here. We thank you, Lord, for who you are, what you're able to do. Strengthen these things that remain. Father, we bless you. In Jesus' name, love somebody. Tell them you love them. Tell them they're blessed. Tell them they're prosperous. Amen. Tell somebody money cometh in the name of Jesus. Oh, really? Money cometh.
And then we used to reach in their pocket and give them some money.